everyone, this is Witcher Pastor, and today, today we're going to be talking about what I consider to be probably the best view of inspiration and inerrancy that I've read. It's actually by everyone's favorite, the late Dr. Michael Heiser. It was an article on his website. We're going to it here. It's called uh, Another Proposed Bellington, Bellingham Statement. Last one, question mark. This was a series of articles he did where he essentially tried to articulate a really good view of inerrancy and inspiration. And uh, he talked with his audience to see which the best ones, and you could see prior updates from it in, uh, in previous articles. But this one, I believe, is the last one. Let me know in the comments section if there's another one that might uh, be better to talk about. But here it is today, and I'd say that it's uh, definitely one of my favorite uh, articles that Dr. Michael Heiser ever wrote. Uh, if you have any other ideas for our articles that we could go through and uh, I could provide commentary on, let's do that. And uh, give, me, give me a shout out in the comment section if you want to do that. So let's get into it. Uh, also, uh, if anyone has an idea of what this whole Bellingham statement thing means, I mean, I don't think it'll be very important as far as, you know, actually understanding what a good inspiration, view of inspiration and inerrancy is. But... I'd love to hear maybe what the background is, if you have any idea about that. So, uh, not too much helpful here, but we can get into it. So, the statement is, I affirm that the Bible is God-given revelation produced at the agency of human authors. The huge, usual process of producing the scriptures was one where human authors wrote on the basis of their own abilities, education, styles, worldviews, backgrounds, and, and idiosyncrasies apart from a point in time divine encounter where the word of scripture were chosen for the authors. Although there are instances in the biblical record where God is said to have dictated what would become part of the biblical text, example, Revelation 2 to 3, the messages to the seven churches, such instances are rare. So, of course, when we get in these discussions about inerrancy, I think our intuition is to think that inerrancy is some type of like really spiritual, crazy, magical thing, that it's different than the other texts, because obviously the other texts are inspired, and if if we have a specific text given by God that is supposedly the Word of God, we would expect that it would be extra special, that God had some absolutely crazy thing to do with it, and Dr. Heiser thinks that he did, but the difference is that it isn't some, you know, magical looking text on the outside looking in. So, the process of inspiration does not require us to contend that God verbally dictated the words of the Bible to the author. Though God did so on rare occasions, at times directly or through a divine agent, the process also does not require us to embrace the idea that God impressed each word on the mind of the author through some silent mental process, as though the author's mind was overtaken by God. Having providentially prepared each writer, I believe God presented the biblical writers with truth through a range of means, including but not limited to dramatic displays of divine power. Time spent listening to the incarnate Jesus or the incarnate Christ's formal education, the reading of scripture already extent, insight given by the Spirit, religious training, and sensitivity to the working of God in their own lives through spiritual devotion. All of these forces and more mold the lives and minds of the authors of the Bible under an overarching divine providence, preparing them to write what, that which God would move the believing community to embrace as canonical. So what he's describing is, it doesn't have to be magical, even though there are texts in the Bible, like Revelation, as he mentioned, that are described as if they're spoken directly from God, but, or, or spoken directly from God to the speaker. But at the same time, God inspired these writers through natural processes like religious training or listening to Christ. Uh, you know, one might say there was nothing magical that happened when Jesus Christ on earth spoke to the, the gospel writers, but then the gospel writers just wrote what they were, their uh, and understanding of the, the entire situation was, and that was inspired. I mean, it was literally Christ incarnate, you know, essentially gone on earth speaking to the writers of the Gospels. Of course, that's not magical, but it's a great example of how something can be inspired and definitely from God, but at the same time, not be some crazy magical thing. 
to go on. While God providentially prepared the writers of the Bible to produce his truth and providentially oversaw the results of their work, this process of inspiration of necessity involved divine accommodation. God was perfectly capable and content to use human language to convey truth to humanity. Divine accommodation in the context of the process of inspiration should not be understood as though the biblical writers chose to communicate with their audience in such a way as to accommodate less learned people. Here he goes, I reject the notion that one human, the author, received words from God and then had to dumb down those words for other people, their audience. This is not divine accommodation, but human accommodation, and is a character of what divine accommodation really is. The decision of God to be willing to allow his weak, limited human creatures to write about who he is and what he has done. This is, of course, uh, really important when we talk about, you know, the, the ancient view of the writers in regards to how they viewed creation, how they viewed the, the cosmos, how they viewed just ancient science in regards to different things that we see in the Bible where we might, as you know, 21st century writers might see, oh, you know, that must, that must be poetry or something like that. But maybe, just maybe, and a lot of these things, Heiser actually thought that God was working through him, through accommodation, to have them, the human authors, write from their vantage point, but also use inspiration and and uh, inspiration and just how God uh, put them in a place where they could convey His message. To continue, in view of the above, I affirm that God used human language to the degree He deemed sufficient, so as to accomplish the creation of the canonical books. Humans do not express anything about God perfectly or completely, nor could God reveal anything about himself in an exhaustive and comprehensive way, as human minds would be unable to comprehend this fullness. Since humans cannot receive all God is, all God thinks, and all God does, what they produce in writing, even under the providence of God, will be articulated in ways that show their limited capacities and finite understanding of God, his ways, and his world. These shortfalls should not be construed as errors, since to do so would be to charge the human author with possessing the limitations of humanity as though the writer could have circumvented those limitations. That the human writers of antiquity chosen by God were writing under the constraints of an imperfect understanding of science is to affirm the obvious, to contend that this means the point of the inspiration process was meant to factualize ancient scientific notions as points of dogma, is to extrapolate from that obvious point to an unnecessary conclusion. I affirm that the standard for God's acceptance of the process of inspiration was not the production of material that neither the ancient writer nor his initial audience would, could have comprehended. Rather, God used humans as they were, with all their limitations, much in the same way he left the task of evangelism and administration of his body of the church to weak human beings. So, we have the talk about the idea that God did not give them, you know, future scientific knowledge that they would have no idea or be able to understand. He he brought them to a place through natural processes most of the time to to convey his message. Nevertheless, in grace, God chose to use human agents to produce revelation about himself for human posterity. God was willing and able to use human writers who utilized a range of normal communicative literary techniques and who wrote according to deliberate theological agendas to adequately and accurately, but imperfectly, describe himself, his plan, his purposes, his acts in history, and his creative acts. God was likewise willing and able to preserve the writers from making erroneous statements about himself, his plan, his purposes, and his acts in history, and his creative acts. Here we have God, or Dr. Michael Heiser, specifically saying that there were never erroneous statements when referring to God, his plan, his purposes, and his acts in history and creative acts. I affirm, therefore, that while the providentially prepared human authors were the immediate source of most of the words of Scripture, God is still the ultimate source of the words of each canonical book. His work of providence was sufficient enough at every point of the way to ensure that the words that he intended to be in Scripture and no others are in fact therein. The Bible derives its authority from this providentially guided process. 
The Bible's authority, in turn, is higher than of any church, local, or corporate, and any tradition about the Bible and its contents, since that tradition did not derive from the same inspiration process as the Bible itself. In, in another article, that's what we'll go through, Heiser uses a wonderful example of how the Bible, or a specific passage in the Bible, talks about how God created humans in a mother's womb. Now, that's not referring to, you know, creation ex nihilo. God is using normal, natural processes to create uh, uh, an infant. And he's doing that in a way that one might say that, well, the text says that it's created, but it's not that that God isn't doing something through that. He's using the natural human processes, but it's it's he's still creating. And in the same way that scripture is inspired, but don't always have to be through, you know, magical processes. God is the ultimate source, even if he is not the direct source, the immediate source. I affirm that the process of inspiration include not only the initial composition of a biblical book, but also any subsequent editorial work done on the text of that book prior to the recognition of a complete sacred canon. Evidence in hand leads to the conclusion that the process of producing the scripture text was subject to editorial activity in terms of additions, deletions, rearrangement, and repurposing. I believe that God oversaw any such processes by means of providential influence and the decisions made by authors and editors so that the words of each canonical book met with God's approval. Any writer or editorial hand whose work of composition or editing preceded the final form of a given canonical book and whose work finds expression in the final, final canonical text was a participant in the process of inspiration. Here we have, uh, there's a good chance that he had in mind something like the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, where it most obviously was not written only by Moses. At the same time, uh, Heiser did believe that most of it was the main part, but there was obviously some editorial hands. I mean, even super, super, super uh, uh, evangelical organizations like Answers in Genesis thinks that there was some type of editing going on where you have kings mentioned or cities mentioned that were very obviously not uh, there at the time. But that Heiser thinks that God inspired the editors, the maybe someone like uh, Ezra that who who compiled the the texts of something like the Pentateuch, and you know obviously not you know making it up or something like that, but you know updating it to allow for greater readability. With respect to learning from the incarnate Christ and with respect to the process of inspiration, the gospel writers were not required to produce, reproduce the exact real-time words that Jesus spoke, nor did they, as we know from the synoptic gospels. Rather, they learned truth and transmitted it in writing as their life context dictated under providence. At times, catch, ap, ooh, at times capturing the ideas they heard very closely, perhaps even verbatim, or on other occasions, applying it in different vocabulary as the need arose. I believe the written result in its final form was entirely faithful and accurate with respect to the content of Jesus' teaching. So it was accurate, it was faithful, but maybe not the exact words. This makes perfect sense, as the gospel writers did not use the exact same language when recounting the same account. Now, one might say, oh, well, maybe it's different accounts, which is entirely possible, but there are some situations where it is pretty much abundantly obvious that they were recounting the same uh, situations, but in different ways. And there is only one way to account for that, which is that they were most likely call it, recalling it from memory. If you disagree with that, put your thoughts in the comment section. I'd like to hear what your idea or theory is behind that, if you disagree. As with hearing the words of Jesus, the writers of Scripture were likewise not required to memorize all the Scripture they heard and learned when writing their own works that would be recognized as canonical. Rather, they were free to apply preceding Scripture and quote it as needed to teach sound doctrine or make a theological point. 
The gap between many quotations of scripture and the source manuscripts from which those quotations came shows us that the writers did not need to reproduce every word they found in text they quote, or in the exact order they found them in. At times, their own context for writing or quoting a text required that the earlier scripture texts of the Old Testament be repurposed in a different literary form or adapted to reinforce a specific exegetical or theological point found elsewhere in the canonical text. This was written in a long time ago, 2009, but still a really great article. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comment section, what you think about it, what you think might be improved, or what you agree on. There's obviously a lot of a lot of difficult passages in the Bible that we must try to understand, but if we do think the Bible is inspired, we have to be able to wrestle with how it can be inspired, but also still look like it might have some editorial hands or not look like it's some type of UFO experiment downloaded into our brains. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you next time. Ah, the aliens are here to download the Bible into our brains. Click and like and subscribe so they'll leave.